Okay, so this week we are working with layers. So we're going to create a little document um, to just kind of get some experience working with some of the different ways that you can use layers in Photoshop. So to start out, I'm just going to start in Photoshop with a new document. Uh, what we've done so far has been mostly work with existing images. And a lot of times in Photoshop, that's how you're going to work anyway. You're just going to be editing existing images. But especially with web design in Photoshop, you spend a lot of time creating new work uh, from scratch and to meet specific size specifications so that you uh, can get it to fit the way that you want in the web page. So we're going to start out with just a new document. And notice that there's a command in keyboard shortcut for a new document. So that's a, a very good keyboard shortcut to learn, really standard keyboard shortcut. And I've mentioned this before, but anytime you see a keyboard shortcut when you're dropping down the menu, just use the keyboard shortcut instead. And if it's something that you do repeatedly enough, you'll quickly learn the keyboard shortcut. So I'm going to press command in on the keyboard to bring open the, the new document window. And when we're in the new document window, we have some settings over here where we can set a specific size and resolution and that sort of thing. Um, and we'll we'll lear learn more about sizes and resolution as we go along. But for now, I'm just going to go to this web preset area here at the top. And I can select from some different um, presets, blank document presets that are geared specifically towards creation for the web. So this is kind of convenient because I don't have to worry about any settings over here. I can just use some preset settings. Uh, there's also templates down here which you can download. You can see I've downloaded a few of these. They have the check mark to show that they've been downloaded. Uh, because I had a client who needed a new Facebook cover image, and so I used this template to make sure I made the cover image the right size. So these, some of these are free. Some of them you have to pay for, but there's a lot of different templates that can help you kind of get started with various projects there. But we're going to just use web medium right here. Uh, if for some reason you can't find this web presets in your new document, uh, we need a 1440 by 900 pixel tall, 1440 wide, 900 tall, 72 pixel per inch image. So you can enter those settings in here. But I'm just going to click on web medium right there. You can see that it automatically sets those settings. And I'll click create. Now. <clears throat> One thing, uh, just in terms of working with Photoshop, we, we've we probably, in the lessons, you should have uh, seen this workspace menu by now. And uh, the default workspace in Photoshop under Window Workspace is Essentials here. Uh, and that's what I'm using. I'm going to reset it just to make sure mine looks like it did coming out of the box. So uh, this this way if you set your workspace to essentials you'll be able to see exactly what i'm seeing here as you're working in your document oh, well i can't reset that um so that what you're seeing what i'm seeing will will match up and then i'm going to click on adjustments right here so i can see these adjustment layers over here um, now what i have in my photoshop workspace right now is a new document that's blank and has a white background um, and then over here you can see that it lists this as an artboard and we're going to learn about using artboards later in Photoshop you can have more than one artboard so that you can have layouts of different sizes in your document we're only going to use this one so we don't need to worry about the artboard for right now and then I've got the blank layer over here layer one um, and as you work in Photoshop, using layers is really a basic kind of fundamental part of working within Photoshop, especially if you're working with an image that has multiple components, different parts to it. And you saw a little bit of that last week when I moved uh, the soccer player over in front of the grass or the soccer ball over in front of the soccer player, I think is what I did. And that moved it in as a separate layer so that it would sit on top of the, uh, of the background image. <clears throat> so... We're going to see how all of that works as we work through this little exercise today. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have a few images that I found that uh, I've got kind of already ready to work with for this. And they're here in this folder on my desktop. Uh, 
the HNC coffee sign, Dr. Pepper, uh, Dr. Pepper sign, this image of Roanoke, and this image of the star. Uh, and I'm, all of these will be in Blackboard for you to work with. So I'm going to open up the image called Roanoke here. And in Photoshop, that opens it in a separate tab up here. So I have two tabs. One has my image of Roanoke. The other has my blank artboard that we're going to be working in. So what I want to do is I want to move this into this image. And uh, one way to do that would be to, to copy and paste. Uh, let's see. If I go to edit, copy is, is grayed out. And that's because I have nothing selected. So if, it, if I want to copy and paste this over, I need to select it first. And I could do that using a selection tool. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to press Command A on my keyboard. And you can see right here that that will select all. So if I want to select the whole image, select all, Command A. So instead of using the menu, I'm going to press Command A. And you see the marching ants now show up around the whole image. Now, one thing to notice as I'm looking at this uh, image of Roanoke is that when I look in the Layers panel over here, which is going to be the focus of our attention today, the Layers panel has one layer called the Background. And so when you open up a, a, any JPEG, and just a typical image, photograph in Photoshop, you'll see the layers looking like this. Uh, a photograph by default it just has one layer called background. And when I have a layer called background, what that means is if I were to erase, and just this is the eraser right here. And if I come over here and use the eraser, it erases away to white. And what it's actually doing is erasing away to the background color. So... Uh, we're, we'll get more familiar with the foreground and the background color here, but this color right here that's in behind the other color, that's the background color. And whatever the background color is, if you erase on the background layer, it will erase right to that, um, to that color. So I'm going to undo that erasing and show you that if I had a different color there, I'm going to click on the background color and choose some other color. If I erase away, it erases to that color. So a background layer is not has no ability to be transparent. It will have a background of whatever the background color is here. If you erase or cut something away, and you've seen that in the lessons in the textbook, uh, when we were using selections and moving those shells around, whenever you moved a shell, the area where the shell used to be got replaced with the background color. So that's, that's something that you've uh, seen before. Okay, so I've got this image. Command A to select all, and then I'm going to copy and come over here to my uh, my artboard that I'm working in and paste. And so now on that layer that was blank, I now have uh, my my picture of Roanoke. Now, so that I can save my progress in this, I'm going to go ahead and save my file just in case my computer dies or something like that. So I'll go to File and choose Save. Again, super common keyboard shortcut in all computers and all programs, Command S. So I would never choose File Save. I would just press Command S. And I'm going to save that as Working File, which is pretty common. I'll call it Roanoke Working File. Uh, pretty common naming for a file that's in progress. The file that you're working on, you just call it the Working File. So I'll use that. And I'll go ahead and press save. Oh, I should note that this is the Photoshop format, which is the, the basic photo, uh, file format in Photoshop. That's the one you want to use basically all the time, not unless you're exporting it for some other use. So if you're saving a working document, that's going to be in the Photoshop file format, not Photoshop PDF, not Photoshop RAW, not Photoshop PPS, just Photoshop right at the top. So I'll save that file extensions PSD stands for Photoshop document. Okay, so I'm going to just close this original Roanoke JPEG. Uh, I'll have it if I need it later, but for now I don't need it anymore because I've moved it over here. And if I use the Move tool up here at the top of the toolbar and move that image around, I can see that it's a little bigger than uh, my space. There's parts of it getting cut off. So I want to resize that so that it fits. I want to see the whole image in my artboard. So to resize, that, that's scaling. I need to scale this image. And there's not a tool over here for scale. There's no tool over here that's just going to let me resize that image. 
So what I have to do to resize it is use the layer panel. Uh, my bad. I'm going to use the edit panel. Under edit, there's a transform submenu. And if you look in this transform submenu, there's a bunch of options for how you can transform whatever you have selected, whatever you're working with in Photoshop. And in this case, I want to scale. Um, but one thing I'll point out while I'm in here is that none of these different transformations have a keyboard shortcut over here. Um, and transforming is something you do so often in Photoshop, it doesn't make any sense that there's not a keyboard shortcut for it. Also, just in terms of working efficiently in the software, if I, any time that I need to use my mouse to go to a specific menu location and then to another submenu location and then make sure I get into that submenu and hit another specific location, that's a lot of really careful mousing that slows you down in your efficiency. So uh, fortunately for the transform command and for scaling, there's a keyboard shortcut for this free transform, Command-T. And if I use that keyboard shortcut, oh, first let me show you what happened. If I go to Edit, Transform, and choose Scale, I get this bounding box around the image, and it's going to let me resize that however I want. Uh, I'm going to press Escape to cancel that. If I go to Edit, Free Transform, and use this command T, so I'm just going to get out of the menu and use command T for free transform. It gives me the same uh, bounding box, so I get the same controls. And if I right click inside that bounding box, I get the same menu of transformations. So for me personally, I don't ever go to the edit menu and come down into transform here and select one of these controls. I always just press command T. And especially for scaling, and that already takes us directly into being able to scale the image. Uh, now I'm going to press Command Z to undo that transformation I just made because what happens if I just drag this handle over, as you can see, the image is getting squished. And uh, that is almost never a good thing. You, you want to make sure you don't squish images when you resize them. Same thing if I go this way, image gets squished. Uh, what I want to make sure I do is to constrain the proportions of the image while I, while I scale it. And you can see that using the corner handle down here doesn't keep that from happening. But what I'm doing to prevent that is I'm holding the shift key while I drag the corner handles. So holding shift while you drag a, a side handle does not prevent it from getting squished. You've got to use a corner handle and hold the shift key. And you can scale that image while keeping its proportions the same. So I'm, I'm using shift key and using these corner handles to resize that down so that it fits here uh, on the page and I'm going to move it right up until it kind of clicks at the top right there. Um, and when you make a transformation, when you're using free transform to resize information on a layer, the, uh, the transformation is going to change the pixels in your image and that is always a negative change. It will always cause the original quality of the image to be reduced a little bit. So for that reason, uh, the change that actually happens to the image doesn't get locked in until you hit this check mark right here. And that's important. Um, I'll show you why that's important in just a minute. But I'm going to click the, the check mark here to apply that change. So now the pixels have been resized. Let me show you what would happen if if uh, if we didn't have that check mark. Let's say that I'm scaling and I've move it down to this size for a minute, but then I decide later, you know what, I need to come back up to this size. Uh, if I zoom in, look at how fuzzy that image has gotten, and that's because this is what it originally looked like. Uh, once I sized it down to this size, I went ahead and, and uh, committed that change. Well, now I've made the this image use many fewer pixels than it did before. I've reduced the number of pixels that make up the image. So then when I come back up to this size again and zoom in, I've lost tons of detail on this image. So that's why you have to you have to uh, click that check mark there to make the change permanent to the pixels in the image. Uh, so you can make as many transformations as you want while you're in that free transform box. And then you click the check mark to say, OK, I'm done. Uh, you can also, as you can see right there in the tooltip, you can just press Enter or Return on your keyboard.
So when you've got that bounding box, you can just hit return. Okay, so I have copied and pasted an image in. It's now on a layer, and I used Command T to scale it while holding the shift key and using the corner handles so that it fits on the page right here. Uh, now, the one of the easiest ways to demonstrate layers in Photoshop is to use some text. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a little text on here. So I'm going to use the T in the toolbar over here, the horizontal type tool. I'll just click out here anywhere in the document, and I'm going to type Roanoke. Oh, I'm going to trash that layer and try again. Use the type tool. Click in Roanoke, Virginia. Now, when you use the type tool, uh, like I've done here, it'll pick up the last settings that you had for whatever type you used. So uh, I want to I'm going to change this. I'm going to see what else I can do with the type. So what I did when I created the type was I just clicked with the type tool here, typed in the type. And then I, after I was done, I clicked on the move tool up here so I could move it around. When I have some type on the page and I want to change it, if I want to edit the type, I need to get back into the text, which I can do by using the type tool here and clicking and dragging over the text like this. And that gives me the type controls up here at the top of the window. So uh, I'm going to try maybe some different typeface here, tungsten narrow, and I'm going to use a different color, maybe black. So all these are settings in the type controls up here at the top. And with uh, these are basic type controls that you would control in, in any program. Just the typeface here, whether or not it's bold or italic, if there are different styles for the typeface. The size of it here, maybe I'll make it 72, so it's a little bigger. And then uh, I can change the alignment, left, right, or center, or whatever there. And then here's the, the color. I can click on that, get the color picker change the color of the type. Um, also, I have this panel button right here. And if I click that, it'll open up the character panel, which has more type controls in both character and paragraph. So if you're getting extra fancy with your type, you can use the character uh, panel or the paragraph panel to, to edit the type. Um, but I'm now I've clicked back on the move tool here so I can move it around. I kind of like what I've got there with the, the type that I selected. And for you, as you're looking in the font menu, for what we're doing right here, you, you might not have the same fonts as me, but what I'm looking for is a big, bold, uh, kind of squished or narrow, you can see this one's called narrow, typeface, so that it'll take up a lot of space on my page when I make it bigger here in a minute. Um, but right now I've got just Roanoke, Virginia, black type, um, in a nice, big, bold typeface, and I'm kind of sticking it right up here into the sky of my image. I think that I'm actually going to change the color of this in a minute, but the first thing I'm going to do is I want to enlarge it some. And we saw when I was using the type tool, you can change the size here. But type uh, sometimes is you want it to just resize it visually without having to worry about what size it is exactly. So I'm going to use the same transform command that I used on the image to resize this type. I'm going to press Command T again. Remember, that gets me right into Free Transform, which gives me access to all these different transformations. Command T gives me the bounding box. And again, I'm going to hold the Shift key and drag the corner handles to resize this text. Get nice and big, put it right up here, kind of the top part of this image. Uh, and I'm moving that around a little bit, just nudging it into place by using the arrow keys on my keyboard, the up, down, left, and right arrows. That's called nudging. We've learned about that in the lesson, so I'm just uh, nudging the type a little bit. And like I said, I want to change the color on that, so I'm going to make it just white. Uh, and this time, instead of using the type tool here and dragging across the text, I'm going to use a different technique to get into the text so that I can edit it. And what I'm going to do is over here in the layers, uh, you can see that by creating a type, some type on the page, it created a type layer. So I have my background layer, which are, or it's not called the background layer, but I'm calling it the background because it's behind the type. So I have the picture of Roanoke, layer one, 
and this uh, text layer, which shows me exactly what text is on that layer, Roanoke, Virginia. It has a T right there to indicate that it's a text layer. Uh, let me do a little bit of housekeeping over here first. I'm just going to rename this layer so that it's actually called Roanoke, so I know what that is. So where it says layer one right there, I'm just going to double click and type Roanoke, hit enter. So now I've renamed this layer. Uh, and in the layers panel, uh, there's a couple things to notice. I have a little bit of a thumbnail here that gives me a hint at what's on that layer. It's pretty small, so it's kind of hard to see exactly, but I can tell that that's that picture of Roanoke. You can rename the layers uh, however you want. The type layer has its own little thumbnail of a T. And then I have this column over here, which has these little eyeballs. And this is the visibility column. So, for instance, if I click on the visibility uh, eyeball for the type layer, it disappears. And then if I click it back, it comes back. So you can turn layers on and off, uh, turn their visibility on and off so they hide or they show up. And then when I click on a layer over here, it becomes highlighted to show me that I have that layer selected. So you can click on a layer to select it. Now, what I came over here to show you is that if I'm working with type and I want to highlight all of that type and get the text controls back over here at the top, one way to do that is click on T over here and click and drag along the text. But you can also just double click on that T. If I double click on the T, it switches me to the type tool and highlights all that text. So usually if I'm trying to just edit all the text, I just double click on the T to get there. And I'm just going to go in and change the color of that text to white. Click OK, and I'm going to click on the Move tool over here uh, to, to get out of the text editing. I could also click on the check mark up here to get out of that. OK, so I've got two layers in my document, uh, the Roanoke picture and the Roanoke Virginia text. Um, another thing that we can do with a layer here, I can turn the visibility on and off, but I can also adjust how uh, transparent or opaque this layer is and how it blends with the layer below it. So I've got the Roanoke Virginia type layer selected, and I'm looking in the layers panel, and there's all this stuff up here. Uh, and we'll get into what more of these things do, but one of the most common parts of this layers panel to use is the opacity in here. So I can drag this opacity down and get a nice kind of faded Roanoke Virginia type showing up at the top of my page. So I'm just going to drag that until I like what I see. You can click the drop down and get the slider, but you can also just click and drag right on the word opacity and it'll adjust it uh, by dragging on the word. So you can do the slider or just click and drag on the word. Uh, so that looks pretty cool. Uh, I think I'll leave it just like that for now. I might make another adjustment a little bit later on. Okay, so I have my two layers, one of them at a lower opacity, 34%. Now what I want to do is I want to make a little area down here at the bottom to put some more text in. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to use a shape. So I'm going to use this shape tool over here. And it's kind of down at the bottom of your toolbar. There's some different versions of that tool, so you might have to click and hold on it to see the the one that I'm using. I'm using the rectangle tool. That's the default tool, so if you've never used the shape tool before on your Photoshop, it'll probably look just like this. I'm going to click on the rectangle tool, and uh, in the options bar up here, there's some setting options, and I want to make sure it's on shape right here, uh, not path or pixels. So shape mode, and I won't worry about any of these other settings for right now. And I'm just going to come down here, click and drag to make a box. Now, I actually want this box to cover the whole area down here. Uh, so I could undo that and go ahead and create the shape bigger than the area down here if I want. Or I could try to create it exactly the size I want it to be. Uh, but it doesn't really matter too much because once I get the shape made, I can still uh, transform it using the Command T scale command. So I'm just going to make it this size for now and I'm going to resize it after I get it looking the way that I want it to. And when I create the shape, uh, I get this properties panel that pops up. And the properties panel tells me some information about the shape I created here. And you have a lot of control over that shape. Right now, I'm only really worried about what color it is. And it has two colors. It has a fill color and a stroke color. The stroke color is the outline 
of the shape. Uh, and right now that's white. So if I were to move the shape using the move tool, you can see that it has that white border. Uh, I don't want it to have a white border. So I'm going to turn that white border off. So I'll click on this white stroke area or border here. And this red, oh, this white uh, rectangle with the red stripe means none. You can see that here on the fill color. And you can see that there is no fill. So I'm going to set my stroke or the border here to none. Get rid of that. But I do want it to have a fill color. So I'll just click on the fill color here and give it a fill color. Now, I don't actually want it to be this red right here, but you can see uh, that I can set fill color for the shape. And then I'll move it down, back down to the area where I want it. I'm going to use the free transform command. I'm going to press command T and just resize that. I'm not using the shift key this time. I'm just dragging these handles to the edges and right up here to the bottom of that picture and click check mark so that that's exactly the size I want it to be. Now, as far as the color I want it to be, I don't want it to be this red at all. What I want it to do is to match the rest of this image. So I'm going to use the eyedropper tool to pick up a color out of the image. So eyedropper tool is here. Uh, I think we used it once before. Yeah, we used it for uh, selecting the right matte color on their transparent images. So I'm just going to click on the eyedropper. And I can click anywhere in this image to pick up a color from the image. And I think I want it to match these dark trees down here at the bottom. So I'm going to click somewhere in there. And that gives me this foreground color that is based on the area where I clicked. And so then, since my rectangle layer is still selected in the Layers panel, I can go up here and click on the Fill Color. And look at that. All these colors that I clicked on while I was in the picture show up right here as recently used. So I'll just click on that one right there. And now I have a... Uh, shape down here which matches the color of the trees down there at the bottom of the screen. So that's that's pretty much what I want that shape to look like. So I'm going to just make the properties panel go away and uh, and now the kind of look of this is starting to come together a little bit. Uh, I want to put some text down here at the bottom uh, just a little sentence welcome to the star city or something like that. So let me use the type tool again. Nothing fancy here. Uh, except that when I when I move my type tool around, you see that it looks a little bit different, whether it's depending on whether or not it's over the image or the shape. If I click into the shape, it's actually going to put the text right into uh, the shape. It won't let the text go anywhere but the size of that shape. And I'm actually going to uh, not do that. Let me just hit the cancel button up here. That's not what I want it to do. I, I just want normal old text. So I'm just going to click out here in the middle, not in that shape. Just out here in the middle somewhere and type welcome to the star city exclamation mark and then i'll use my move tool drag it in and you see as i drag it in there it disappears because it's using the exact same color i'll go ahead and drag it in and then double click on the t over here to get it selected and make it a different color like white so it really shows up and so there's this text. I want it to be bigger than that. So again, Command T takes me into scale. I'm going to use Shift so that the text doesn't get stretched. And I'll just enlarge it till it fits a little bit better down there. And I could do some different things here to make that blend in a little bit more. I could reduce the opacity to have something kind of nicer there. Or I could do the same thing I did a minute ago with the eyedropper tool select a color from somewhere in the image so it'll get the pink from the sky up here and I could apply that to the text color I could double click click up here and just use my eyedropper when I'm in that uh, color picker the eyedropper pops up so that I can click up here and apply that color to the text so I can do that I'm going to cancel that because I want to show you another good keyboard shortcut so my text is still white and I use the eyedropper to uh, to click in the sky to pick up this pink color from the sky. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to I'm going to try this light blue right here from the mountain. <clears throat> so you can see right there in my foreground color, I got that nice light blue, and I've got the text layer selected over here in layers. So if I want to just apply the foreground color to that text, there's a keyboard shortcut that will do that. And that's just the Option key and the Backspace or Delete key, and that'll that fills with the foreground color. So that just tells that text to be the color 
whatever my foreground color is. Uh, so it looks nice. I'm going to leave it like that. So I've got a couple of shapes down here, or a couple things going at the bottom of the page down here to create this banner across the bottom. I've got the blue rectangle and the light blue Welcome to the Star City text. And um, so I like that as a as a unit. Those two things belong together. So I'm going to do something called making a group in the Layers panel to stick them together so that they I can use I can kind of interact with them as one thing. And the way that I'm going to do that is when I click on the layers over here in the layers panel, whichever layer I click on gets selected. Well I can select more than one layer. Um, for instance if I hold the shift key down, I've got the top layer selected. If I click on the bottom layer, because I held shift, they all get selected. <clears throat> now I don't want them all selected. <clears throat> Excuse me. If I hold the command key down, the control on the PC, I can select more than one layer without all of them getting selected. <clears throat> so I can command click or control click on different layers like this and select separate layers. I just want these two layers. So I'll click on the Welcome to Star City type layer and then I'll hold command or shift and click on the rectangle layer <clears throat> to get them both selected. So now I have these two layers selected in the layers panel. It's the blue background and the light blue text. And I want to make those into one uh, kind of unit that I can move around as one. And to do that, I'll create a group. Right here at the bottom, there's a little folder that says create a new group. Uh, it's probably up here somewhere too. Layer, new, group from layers. Um, that would do the same thing that I'm doing here. But just by clicking that little folder down there at the bottom with some layers selected, when I click that, they get grouped together into a little group. And you can see I can turn off both of those layers at once by clicking the eyeball. If I expand it open, those two layers are inside that little folder. And it says group one, and I'm just going to call it bottom banner. So I just double clicked on the name and typed bottom banner for the name. So that's a group, and that's super useful in layers in Photoshop. You're going to use that a lot, so uh, kind of get used to that. Um, I think you can do it with a keyboard shortcut. Yeah, you can also do that by pressing Command G, and that's the group command all in all of the Adobe Creative Cloud software. You can do these groups like this in all the different programs. Uh, but I, I'm going to undo that. I don't want these two to be in a group, but I just wanted to show you Command G works for a keyboard shortcut or this little button down here. <coughs> Okay, so I've got blue background, the light blue text in my bottom banner group. I've got my original uh, background, the Renook image, and I've got the text there faded back. <coughs> now, what we're going to do is uh, bring in a few more images and kind of get them interacting in this overall thing in a couple of different ways. So the first thing I'm going to do is open up a new image. Uh, so I'm going to go to File and choose Open. Of course, I'm going to use the keyboard command, Command-O. Easy to remember, keyboard shortcut, Control-O if you're on PC. Um, so I'll just press Command-O. And then I'm going to open this coffee sign. So just like when I opened the Roanoke picture a minute ago, I've got the separate um, tab in Photoshop here. It has this coffee sign. And I picked this image particularly because it has the uh, <clears throat> clean background it should be fairly easy for me to get this selected so that I can bring it over into my other image. So I'm going to see how it works. I'm going to use this quick selection tool over here and we've used that before last week and I'm going to try the select subject button which we also used last week. So I'll just click select subject. Let's think about it and then it it gives me the marching ants and I can see some issues with that for instance it didn't get all the bricks down here and maybe it missed some stuff in here uh, there might be some problems the easiest way for me to check and see what it got and what it didn't is go ahead and go into the select and mask dialog that we used before and it definitely has some weirdness that I need to fix before I try to move it over into my other image I'm going to adjust the transparency here this is uh, we also looked at this, so I can see the bricks coming back down at the bottom. And that's just showing me what my selected stuff looks like versus what the original image looks like. I'm going to go about half on that so I can see everything that's there. And I need to 
um, use my tools here to to fix this. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the brush right here. And if I use that brush, I can come in and paint the bricks in because I I do want the bricks to get selected. So I'm just going to take a minute to paint those in. <clears throat> And right here, there's a very straight line I want to paint. And you can paint a straight line by clicking and then moving to the other end of where you want the straight line to be and holding shift while you click. And it just paints a straight line right there. So I'm going to uh, make my brush smaller. I'm using the left bracket key to make my brush smaller and do the same thing for that signpost right there for this framework and scaffolding that's holding the sign up. I need to just make some straight lines there to make sure that's there. Uh, and I'll zoom in on this a little bit so I can see it a little bit more clearly. I'm going to press Command and the plus sign on the keyboard to zoom in. And I see some stuff missing from the cup right here. It needs to be painted in. If I accidentally paint stuff I don't want to, I can just undo or I can hold the Option key and paint it away. So I can fine tune this selection over here a little bit. Um, I can also use that quick selection tool up top and you see that by clicking there I added the sky in I actually want that sky to go away so I could use the option key uh, and if I make my brush bigger you see that there's a minus sign there a little minus sign shows up in there if I use the option key but I can also just click up here in the minus and click into that area and make my brush a little smaller here and click into this area I want to get rid of the sky in these areas where it shouldn't be. <clears throat> so I need to fine tune a little bit up in here where the sky is showing up. I'm going to actually Command Plus or Control Plus if you're on the PC a couple more times and get rid of these. Make my brush a little smaller. Get in there and get rid of that stuff. So a little bit of fine tuning needed to get this selection to look exactly the way that I want. <clears throat> and as you use Photoshop more and more, you'll get uh, more comfortable with with when you need to do that and how to do it. But the basic kind of tools over here on the left, let me adjust that selection. And then just like last week, I'm going to use layer mask right here. Click OK. And there's my sign with the background removed. Same that we did last week for the GIFs and the pings, um, but this time it's to, to so that I can bring it in as a layer into this other document. Now when we did it with the picture of Roanoke, we did select all and copy and paste. But if I look in my coffee sign over here, I have this layer, layer zero. It's already a layer of its own, and I'll just go ahead and name it coffee. <clears throat> and if I use the move tool, I can move that around. It doesn't do me a whole lot of good to move it around inside this image. I want it to be over here in this image. So there's a couple of ways that I can do that. One is that I can go to the Window menu and arrange my documents so that they're I can see them both on the, on the screen at once. So Window, Arrange, Two Up Vertical. And there now it shows the coffee sign and my little uh, postcard-like image that I'm working on. And I can just drag the coffee sign right over there and let go and it puts it into my composition that I'm working on. <clears throat> so that works great. I'm going to do that for this one and I'll show you another technique on another image. I don't need the coffee sign anymore so I'll just close that and I'm not going to save my changes. And so here's the coffee sign. If I look at my layers panel it came in just like it was in the other document as its own layer and this little uh, thing right here is the uh, layer mask and I talked a little bit about layer masks last week, but there's the layer mask on the image. I don't need to do anything with that. I'll just leave it like it is. And I'm going to uh, kind of stick this over here. Oh, it's too big, so I'm going to resize it. So again, Command-T for free transform. It gives me the, the bounding box, and I'm going to hold the Shift key while I drag these corner handles <clears throat> to resize that down a little bit so it's like maybe like that big. <clears throat> and I'll press the check mark and if I zoom in on what's going on you can see it's over the text Roanoke and I'm okay with that uh, but it's also over my bottom banner down here and I don't want it to be over that 
And the reason that it's on top of that is because of the stacking order and the layers over here. So that's been happening as we go along, but it hasn't been a problem yet that every time I add something new, it stacks on top of all the other stuff. It actually stacks on top of whatever layer you have selected when you bring it in. And since I had just created this group, it popped in right on top of the group. I don't want it to be uh, on top of the group. I want it to be behind that bottom banner. So uh, what I need to do is change its stacking order in the layers. And there might be a way in the layers panel. Yeah, if I go to the layers menu right here to arrange, I can send it backward or send it to the back or whatever I want to do. So for instance, watch this coffee um, layer in my layers panel. If I choose send to back, it moves it behind everything else. It disappeared because now it's hiding behind the picture of Roanoke. So you can use layer, arrange, and bring forward, send it back, and all this stuff to move stuff forward and backward in the layers stack. Uh, you can also use these keyboard shortcuts, which are really good keyboard shortcuts to memorize. That's the bracket keys that are next to the P on the keyboard uh, with the command or control and shift. <coughs> but <coughs> it might be easier just to click and drag in the layers panel. So I can just click and drag a layer up and down in the layers panel. And as I do, you see a blue line show up. The blue line is showing me where it's going to go when I release it. So when I drag down, get that blue line. I'm going to put it below uh, the, right now I've put it below the text, and you see now the text is on top of that. I don't want the text on top of that, so I'm going to move it up above the type and just below the bottom banner so that it's now behind the banner down here, but on top of the text. That's how I want it to be. So I've got it stacked in the stacking order, so it'll do that. All right, so now I've got the uh, H&C coffee sign clipped out of its background, moved in on its own layer in the layers panel. And I'm going to do the same thing with the Dr. Pepper sign. So I'm going to uh, open another document. Now I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut, but file, open, oh, there it is, command O. But I'm going to click out of there and just press command O. And I have the Dr. Pepper sign here. So here's my Dr. Pepper sign. And I picked this one also because it had a nice clean sky background, so it would be really easy to select. Uh, and so I'll use the quick selection tool and use select subject again. <clears throat> and after it thinks about it, I'll click select a mask uh, to see how that looks. And I need to zoom in a little bit. That looks pretty good. It looks really good. Uh, but I am going to use the minus on the quick selection tool to click in this sky right here. Get rid of those chunks of sky. And that's probably good like that. It actually got rid of them down there pretty well. Not right there. <clears throat> okay. Layer mask. Click OK. And again, I have it clipped out of its background. You can see the layer mask that it made. I'm going to name this Dr. Pepper. And <clears throat> when I moved the coffee sign over earlier, I did this window arrange two up to get them side by side. This time I'm not going to fool with that. I'm just going to use the move tool and I'm going to drag the Dr. Pepper sign over into my working file. And I'm going to do that just by clicking and dragging it. And you got to watch my mouse. You see my mouse right here? Watch where it is. I'm click and drag. Keep an eye on the mouse. I'm going to move the mouse up here to the tab and hold it for a second and it switches, and then I'm going to drag back down into the image and release. I'm going to undo that for a second and show you a problem. And what you don't want to do is click and drag up here, and as soon as that tab shows up, let go, because it doesn't actually bring your image in. So you have to click and drag, wait, and then drag it back down into the image and release, and you'll get your image where you want it. And you can see it actually stuck it behind the banner this time because I had... Uh, the coffee sign selected, so it puts it right on top of the coffee sign. You can also see I didn't do a great job of my uh, removing the sky. There's a couple of spots where the sky is still showing up. I'm going to go ahead and move this over here where I want it to be. And I'm not going to worry about fixing that for now. There is a way that I can fix it, but I'm going to leave it just like it is for now so we can move on to the other uh, stuff that we want to fix. I'll just stick this over here in the corner. So now I've got these two signs in, in the image. And 
the the last part of this that I want to bring in, I've got one more image. I don't need the Dr. Pepper image anymore, so I'll just get rid of it and not save. Um, I should probably save the working file in case my computer dies, so I'll just save that. Command S is the keyboard shortcut. I'll save if I want to use the menu. I'm going to press Command S to save the file. And the last image that I'm going to bring in here, I'm going to press Command O for open, is the star. <clears throat> so I'll open that up. And here I have this image of the star, and I chose it because it had a black background. And I'll show you why in just a minute. But this is going to let me blend this in really easily. So I'm not even going to clip this out. I'm not going to do select subject or any of that stuff. I'm going to leave the background. And I'm just going to do the same thing with the move tool. Drag the image up, get to the uh, tab, bring it back down into the picture, and release it right here in the middle. OK, so. I've got a, a few more things that I'm going to do to this image, and the next few things I'm going to show you are layer or commands that you can use in the layers panel to change the way that the layers interact with each other. So the first thing I'm going to do is with this image of the star. I don't want that black background to show up. I did pick the image because it had the black background, but I don't want it to be in the picture. I want it to disappear. So one way to get rid of it would be to do the selection like we've done on the sides to get rid of the background. But if I have a pure black background like this one, I can use what's called a blending mode in my layers panel to make that background go away. Now right here where it says normal, this is the blending mode menu. And there are a bunch of different blending modes available. And honestly, uh, some of these, I don't even know what they do or why they're there or what they're for. Uh, there's a bunch. The best way to get a feel for what they do is to just flip through them. And you'll notice that sometimes stuff happens and sometimes it seems like nothing happens and it's kind of hard to figure out why you would use some and why you wouldn't use others and that sort of thing. Um, the normal is just regular blending. It just it does acts like you just stacked an image on top of another image. The most common that you'll use in here are multiply, screen, and overlay. Uh, although there's some others like hue and color that are really useful. And as you get more familiar with Photoshop, you'll come across things where these blending modes are used a lot and get more familiar with some of the value of using them. Um, for now, I'm going to use the one blending mode that will work for this image. And what the one I'm going to use is screen. And I'll just tell you what I know it's going to do before I use it. What screen does is it acts kind of like it, as if I was taking a projector, uh, like you'd have in a classroom, just an overhead projector type thing, or a, you know, computer projector, and project this image of the star on top of whatever's below it. And so if I was projecting this with a projector, anything that's black, if I'm sending with a projector, black means that no light is being sent in that area. So if I projected the picture of the star on top of the picture of Roanoke, wherever there was no light, nothing would show up. And wherever there is light, like the star, it would kind of blend in with the picture that I'm projecting it onto. So if I choose screen, dark stuff, black stuff just disappears, and the rest of the image blends in with what's below it. So that that uh, is pretty cool little technique right there, because now I've got the star kind of blending in <clears throat> with the uh, city behind it. I want it to be bigger than that, so again, I'm going to use Command T to see how often we're using that command. And I'm going to hold the Shift key to keep my proportions and just resize that star until it kind of looks the way I want. And if I wanted to rotate it while I'm in there, I can move my cursor just to the outside of one of these um, control handles here and get that curved. So I could rotate it a little if I want, make it fit in there a little bit better. That's kind of cool. And then I'll just hit the check mark, and I might nudge it with the arrow keys a little bit to get it just where I want it, something like that. So that's blending modes. Uh, we'll, we'll, you'll learn more about blending, blending modes as you go. The uh, best way to get familiar with them is just to try the different modes and see what it looks like in the image. You get a very different results depending on which one you use. But for this, I'm using the screen blending mode to let it blend in like that. Okay. <clears throat> And that's more or less what I want this thing to look like in the end. I'm just going to make a couple little fine-tuned changes with a couple of different features and layers. So one, 
is that I want to change the color of the background image a little bit. The uh, blue and pink is really nice. It's a very pretty image, but I'm going to adjust it a little bit just to see how I can change the color on that. To do that, I'm going to use an adjustment layer. Adjustment layer, uh, as I think we may have seen in one of the lessons, is a layer that will show up on my layers panel and will change, uh, make an adjustment to the to the image. So adjustments is here in the adjustments panel. You can also get to the adjustment layers down here in this little drop, this little button at the bottom of the layers panel with the black and white circle. And so you can see all these different adjustments here. And the one I want to use is hue and saturation. Now it's available up here somewhere. I think it's this one. So you can see if I hover over this button, it says hue saturation. Or I can hit this drop down and choose hue and saturation. Either one does exactly the same thing. And what happens is it creates a new layer with a different little thumbnail here for hue and saturation adjustment. It tells me it's an adjustment layer. The properties panel opens up. And if I drag the sliders in here, you see it'll change the colors. So let's say I don't want anything too drastic. Maybe I just want to go a little more purple from the blue to do that. I can also adjust the saturation, which is the purity of the color, so I can make it super colorful or practically black and white. And as I'm making these adjustments to that image, one thing you'll notice is that it's also applying those changes to the, uh, the coffee sign, the Dr. Pepper sign, and the star, as well as the picture that's below everything. And I actually only want that apply to apply to the picture. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to make that be the change that I'm making. So I'm going to click away the properties panel and look at the layers panel to see why that's happening. So you see where my hue and saturation adjustment layer showed up. If I turn it off and on, you see what it's doing to the image. And I can see exactly where those changes are happening. I can see that's happening on Dr. Pepper and H&C and the star too. The reason it's applying to everything is because of how high up in the stack it is. You see it's not changing the bottom banner. And that's because it's below the bottom banner. So I can move that around just the way I did earlier with the other stuff. If I move it to the very top, now it also changes the bottom banner. I only want it to change the picture of Roanoke, so I'm just going to move it back down below uh, everything and just above the Roanoke picture. So I can click and double click, or sorry, uh, turn on and off the visibility of that layer with the visibility icon. And you can see that the only thing that's changing is the Roanoke picture and not the star or the signs or any of that. So I'm going to leave it just like that. Uh, now that did wreck my color coordination that I had with this stuff down here, so I'll probably fix that. So uh, that's all inside the bottom banner folder, so I'll click on the rectangle. And then the properties over here, I need to uh, identify a new color for that. Maybe I'll, I'll use the eyedropper. And go right back in the same area where I got that color before and set that as my color for that box. And then maybe for the text, I'll just select that, click here on the color picker in the properties. That's one way I can do that. And I'll click in here to select the color for that. Okay. <clears throat> The, uh, oh, I didn't rename this layer. This is my star. Better name that just so I can keep track of things. So now you can see in the layers, I have the bottom banner. I have the Dr. Pepper sign, the star, and the coffee. I have my Roanoke, Virginia type up here, and the hue and saturation change to the color, um, and my Roanoke picture in the background. And the last thing I want to do is I'm, I think that the Roanoke, Virginia text is kind of disappearing back here a little bit. I'm going to try to make it stand out a little bit more. So with that layer selected, I'm going to add a layer effect or a layer style. So with the Roanoke, Virginia type layer selected in the layers panel, I'm going to go down here to the bottom where it says FX. And if I click, there a menu of effects shows up. Layer styles is what they're called, but it, they also refer to it as FX, you can see. Uh, and I just want to drop shadow. So right down here at the bottom is drop shadow. And if I, I get this uh, menu that shows up, but if I turn the preview on and off right here, you can see that there's a nice little shadow that shows up around my text. 
and I can adjust what happens when I move where it shows up or make it uh, kind of thicker or make it fuzzier or less fuzzy. So I've got some control. I can also click and drag up in here just to position it wherever I want it to be. And I can change the opacity here so that it's very, it becomes very, uh, I lost it. Okay, it's going slow. So I can make it very faint if I want or uh, really show up strong. I want it to be strong, so I'm going to make the opacity pretty high and click OK. Uh, and save my work because that's that's pretty much what I want this to look like in the end. Um, I'm going to do one thing on my keyboard. I'm going to press Shift Tab, which hides all these panels on the right, so this looks a little bit better. And then, then I'm going to press F on the keyboard two times. Actually, yeah, two times. Um, so that I can just make everything disappear and just look at the finished product here. Um, now I'll press F again to get back and Shift Tab again to get everything back. That's just a nice way to kind of preview your work. You can uh, hide the panels on the right with Shift Tab, or you can just press F and flip through these different screen modes. Um, but ultimately, I've used layers here to combine a bunch of different images together, some of them with the background removed, and use some different effects uh, in the layers like the drop shadow on the type, the opacity on the type reducing its opacity, using an adjustment layer to change the color of the picture, uh, and using a group here to organize things and kind of get them uh, stuck together so that they'll behave as one thing to create this kind of uh, composition this this layout or design in Photoshop and this is something you end up doing quite a lot as you're uh, working for the web you build uh, online advertisements this way or you might build a mock-up for a page this way or a, a social media graphic for a client or a header for a website or other parts of website design using layers using some of these different layer techniques um, so that's that's what we want to make sure we're getting familiar with this week. The lesson in the textbook is about uh, much of the same stuff. So you should, this after this week, have a pretty good idea of how to work with layers in uh, in Photoshop.